Does uh, everybody hear me well? Oh, um, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, in our company, we're creating software for uh, sports clubs to collect money from club members and then pay it out to treasurers. And we always want to make it as easy as possible for our customers. So we support many payment methods. And sometimes some payment methods have really different money flows. For example, with SIPA direct debit, you basically take money from someone's account and then uh, because that would be a little bit dangerous, uh, that person has up to three months or even more in some countries to charge it back, no questions asked. So the money can go both directions. Uh, when we support paying with usual credit transfers, sometimes people pay a little bit less than expected or a little bit more because they want to pay for two installments. And that sometimes creates uh, edge cases that we didn't think about. So every time we encounter such an ed edge case, we start to think, can we do better? Like, can we prevent it? Can we test it? Can we generate uh, all those uh, different examples? And that's why I became interested in property-based testing. I started asking around my local community what were their encounters with property-based testing. And the first one is the talk from Lambda Day's uh, previous year. And it was by Joseph Valim. It was called introducing Hughes-driven development. So the idea of the talk was that everything that John Hughes does is good for creating a computer programming language. And uh, one of the features was that uh, Jose wanted to introduce property-based testing as a core part of Elixir language. In the end, he didn't because property-based testing frameworks are huge beasts with their own trade-offs and they don't belong as a core. However, it sparked a discussion about property-based testing. The example he used was very basic test on a string concatenation. So we're uh, taking, creating a left string with a generator, then the right one, and then we concatenate them, asserting that both the left one and right one are in the output string. And of course, there's a problem with that property. Like it's not exhaustive, right? Because if our uh, concatenation function reverses the strings, the property still passes. So we would have to come up with a couple more properties, but this one is pretty basic and it got the point. Another common example is uh, list reversal. So a reversal of reversal of a list is the initial list and that holds for every list. Of course, that's another kind of property that isn't really exhaustive, right? If we support identity function for reversal, it will still hold. So when I asked my colleagues, what do they think about property-based testing? They said, is it that thing where you test data structures, but you can't really test them because like you never test everything and you still need to use unit tests. And I was like, no, 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 really. There are epic, <coughs> epic wins uh, connected with property-based testing. For example, Quivic tested Autosar systems for Volvo. Autosar is basically a, a bus that connects all electronic devices in your car, and it has to be really well tested, and all the devices that connect to it also need to have certificates. So there was a team of people working on each device and trying to come up with unit <laughs> tests. And then Quivic came and they started uh, building a model for it. And after just a week, they found that one of the devices that uh, was already tested and passed the test has really strange behavior. It was a radio. And when you were turning the volume up or down, the brakes didn't work. <laughs> So it, it's pretty huge, right? And the problem was with NDNS because uh, they got the NDNS wrong, the bytes were in reversed order. So most of the operations were actually okay and they had smaller priority than everything else. But uh, turning up the volume, which was the lowest priority of all, uh, get to the second byte. And then because of this reversed order, it had the highest priority higher than breaks. And just, just after 
a couple of weeks they found such a big, huge issue, basically. Another big example is testing level DB. So Google created this database and it had problem with ghost keys and they didn't uh, had time and didn't have uh, a clue about what's causing them. So they started writing a property based test, they modeled the database and they found a counter example uh, or an example that fails and creates ghost keys and the minimal example was 17 consecutive operations. So that's an example you would never write in any unit test, like it's so big. However, it's small enough that if you supply it to someone that needs to debug that application, it's uh, possible to uh, get to the bottom of what happened. Another great example is uh, a talk by John Hughes, mentioned second time today. Uh, and it was from Lambda Days 2016. So he was using uh, property-based testing to test Dropbox. And the problem with testing that thing is you don't know in which order the operations go to Dropbox. If you have two computers and you uh, append something to a file on first one and then on the second one, the operations may be out of order in the Dropbox. So what uh, the researchers did they uh, created a model that took all the possible orderings and all the possible outcomes of what Dropbox could do with those operations. And if testing real Dropbox really showed the same thing as any of those possibilities, then the test passed. And they've still found a problem with Dropbox when you could even lose data because of the synchronization issue. So that's the real property-based testing. So the, the problem, I think, uh, is that there are talks with very basic data structures, then there's like nothing, nothing, more nothing, and then there are epic success stories, right? So what's in the middle? This talk is about what's in the middle, and it's called stateful testing. The problem with stateful testing is, uh, coming back to the example in uh, our job, is that the, you can't just generate stuff randomly. When you generate a list, the elements don't depend on each other. But I can't, for example, create a random stream of financial events because you can't charge back a transaction if someone didn't pay it first. So you need very specific generators that hold state. But actually, to get that, there are a couple of things that we need to cover. So I will start with how do you come up with good properties? Uh, then speak about Oracle properties, generators, shrinking, state handling in Erlang and Elixir, how to build models. And at some point, all those things will seem unconnected, but in the end, there will be an example of stateful test execution that will gather everything together. So firstly, coming up with properties. I created, I showed this example about lists and list reversal and said that it's not exhaustive. So first thing about property-based testing is that it should be exhaustive. It's designed in such a way that it should be easy to make very exhaustive properties. If we want to test list reversals, we can take any list, then take an integer from the range of zero to length of list minus one, and then if we take element k from the first list, it should be equal to the element length minus k in the second list. So that's covering almost all cases. If I support wrong uh, representation of uh, wrong reversal function, like this one property doesn't hold. And what's important about it is I'm not re-implementing reversal, right? I'm just uh, taking its definition, like it's more mathematical. Uh, actually, that property is not enough because it doesn't test the empty list case. We can't find an integer from range from zero to length minus one, but still it, it's a pretty good property. But what, what about properties of something like hashing function? So if I want to come up with a property, I could say, okay, I know its length. It should be always the same. But again, it doesn't say anything about how the function should work. 
And with such cases where it's very hard to come up with properties, uh, we may use something that is called oracle properties. Oracle properties basically say for all <coughs> inputs of the tested system, it should give the same output as an oracle. So for the hashing function, we might, for example, take OpenSSL and say, test our function, check what OpenSSL returns. If they are the same, then your implementation is probably OK. Another jump to different topic, generators. So property-based testing is great uh, and uh, different from fuzzing because you first generate the examples and they get bigger and bigger. If we take, for example, a simple data like string, the smallest possible string is empty string. And then the generator makes sure to make it a little bit bigger, but it also usually is clever enough that some values will come up more often than others. So it will start with basic characters, then maybe some numbers and special characters, but still from ASCII range. Then we go further and further to like Unicode characters, new lines and so on. And then when the test fails because of one of those characters, shrinking starts. So you have a uh, test that fails because of that new line. Then your framework tries to get and remove some of the characters and check if the test still fails. It does it a couple of times until finally you get something that is a minimal counterexample, something that really breaks the test. So with such output at the end, you're pretty sure that what's breaking your code is new line character, right? You don't get that gibberish. Okay, next seemingly unconnected topic is handling state in Erlang and Elixir. So one of the most uh, useful things in uh, Erlang and Elixir is GenServer. And GenServer, from the conceptual point of view, is just a loop that takes its state as a first argument, and then uh, in the end, it computes a new state and just calls itself recursively. What's happening inside that loop is that you take a message from outside world. That message usually has some commands to run on that state and the color pits so that we know where do we return that message. And later, we want to send the return value to the caller. But what is really clever here is that all the state transformations are in the handle call callback. You need to implement that callback, and this is actual logic of your application. You just call handle callback with that command, color pid, and state, and it transforms state one to state two, and then calculates the answer. It is very important <laughs> because all of those handle calls are pure, so you can very easily reason about them, and something like that is later used with stateful property-based testing. Okay, so we're getting to the point, how do we test something that requires state? So it's very similar to Oracle properties. We say that we want to generate some commands that we will use on our system. And then our system under tests, getting those commands should return exactly the same thing as our model that we will build. But how do we build the model? Let's, let's get to an example. In Poland, we have a social security number. It's called PESEL. And PESEL has this format where first six digits are a birth date. So you start uh, with year, then month, then day. So this guy was born January 1st, 1990. Uh, then there are four uh, numbers of who this guy really is. And the X is special because even Xs mean females and odd Xs mean males. And the Q at the end is a check digit. What's uh, really surprising for some people is that for people that are born after 2000, uh, we need to add 20 to the month. 
So someone who's born uh, January 1st, 2005, has 21 in the month. So this broke a couple of systems when 2000 came, and that is a good thing to test with, to test with property-based testing. So we will create a very simple example, a patient database with only two operations. We search patient by its PESL, or we add patient with PESL name and surname. So the first thing is, how can we model this? So our database can have sharding, can be uh, connected via internet and have a lot of stuff, but we need a simple model that captures what the database does and preferably runs in memory. So a key value store is basically a map, an Elixir map uh, where, with pestles as keys and a tuple with name and surname as value is sufficient to model everything that our database does. Next, to actually start testing the database, we need to define five callbacks. These callbacks are from proper uh, framework, but with QuickCheck, it's very, very similar. So the first callback is commands, and this is our generator. It will generate the commands that we will pass to our tested system. And what's really important about it is that it takes state as a first argument. Initial state is something that returns the initial state. It's uh, usually pretty obvious. Next state function uh, is separated from actual commands and it only transfers state one to, to another state uh, given that command because sometimes the preconditions for the command uh, are not met. So let's get to the example. For our system, we have only two uh, API functions, right? Search and add patient. For the search function, we can create a generator by saying that we generate a call to a function to module patient DB to a function search. And the last thing is a list of arguments. So we will need a PESL generator that I leave out. The second thing is uh, call patient DB with add patient. And this one takes three arguments, PESL, name, and surname. So that was easy and we didn't even touch the state that we passed to that uh, command generator, but we will do it in a minute. Next thing is the next state function and we also need to implement it for all commands. So for searching by PESL, we do nothing with the state. We just return it as is. Like if we just search in the database, we don't change the database, so that's okay. For adding patient, we need to actually put that patient in our model database. So we put uh, the pestle with name and surname to uh, our store. Then the precondition function just answers the question, does it make sense at the given moment? Postcondition function says if it worked and we're not implementing it right now. But let's get to naive execution right now. We have our model, we have our test, and it starts generating commands. So we start by searching patient P1. Of course, he's not in the database yet because nothing is. Then we're adding a patient with PESL P2. We are searching for patient with PESL P3. And even if we have many commands in the generated input, we could always generate a new PESL. So with this kind of naive execution, uh, we're basically shooting at arrows and we want to test our database if it correctly holds the state, but we might never get to it, right? So uh, there are uh, tricks to make sure that we actually test what we want to test with such a stateful system. So we will extend the commands that we use for that purpose. Instead of just searching for any patient, we will have one command for searching for existing patient and another one for searching a patient that is missing from the database. And the same thing with adding, we will have uh, adding a new patient and adding a patient with PESL that already exists. I will cover only one of those examples and this is searching for an existing patient. So before we had a call to a module, uh, 
and then search. Now we have search existing. And now, instead of just generating random pestle, we will use the state that we pass to this command function. And we will say, get me one of the keys in the state. And that will be sufficient to uh, take only existing patient in uh, this example. We will also need to do it second time in the precondition function, because that, that's a precondition to run that particular command. OK, so let's now look at how guided execution might look like. Let's say we're first generating searching non-existent patient. It can work. Then we have adding patient uh, with PSLP2. Then searching this particular patient. So if we want to now generate search existing patient, it has to be P2 because it's the only patient in our database. So this P2 is fixed. Then let's uh, add a patient with PESL P3. And let's say that this guy is born after 2000 and it breaks the database uh, somehow. We're still generating the commands, so we will have searching uh, existing patient. And just for the sake of the talk, we've uh, now uh, took the P3. The, the test, if we run it, obviously fails. And it fails on that last command because uh, the patient doesn't exist if the previous command failed. So now, Proper will try to shrink to the smallest possible counterexample. And it tries it uh, almost the same way as with strings by removing commands from the set. But it's not that simple this time. If we want to remove the first command, search non-existent patient with PESLP1, it's possible. It's totally OK to do that. And the test still makes sense. But let's say we want to remove the fourth command, add patient with PESLP3. If we remove it, we will also need to remove the next one, because it searches the patient that no longer exists. In that case, Proper needs to remove both of them, reruns the test with just the two commands, and says, OK, now the test passes. <laughs> So I need to backtrack. I need a minimal failing example. So now, if we want to remove add patient with PESLP2, it will also remove the existing patient, the search for the existing patient with PESLP2. And that's actually our minimal counter example. Proper might need to try a couple of times to remove the first one or the second command from the output, but each time it needs to backtrack because that's the actual minimal failing example. And that way, we will quickly know that uh, the problem is with adding particular kind of pestles. So to sum up, there are three phases of uh, property of stateful property-based testing. There's command generation, and that uses only the model. The command generation doesn't touch the database. It uses your model. It uses the preconditions you've written. And uh, it creates a set of commands that you will run on your system. The next phase is test execution that uses generated calls with intermediate states for validations. And this one depends more on post condition. I didn't show it in the presentation. But in the post condition, you might uh, fail the test immediately if something goes wrong. And the last part is when the execution uh, fails, we have the shrinking phase. And this one uh, does the test execution over and over with smaller and smaller counterexamples. So to sum up, there are epic success stories of property-based testing. And I believe that it's a very valuable tool to have in your toolset. However, there is a considerable upfront investment because you need to learn a couple of different things before you even can start. And then creating a model, debugging it can be very challenging. However, if your system has an exponential number of inputs or many features that interact with each other, and it's not an accidental complexity, but really the complexity of the problem at hand, then property-based testing is your best friend. Uh, I've made my presentation mostly uh, using that book. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, property-based testing with proper Erlang and Elixir, and it's written by Fred Herbert. I'm not paid to say that. It's that good. 
and uh, it also shows all of the intermediate uh, things that you need to learn. So it's not only just showing you how to use the framework, it really teaches you how to do property-based testing. And yesterday, uh, during uh, John's uh, talk, he also showed some examples. That stuff is also covered in that book. So it's really, really great, and I encourage you to read it. That's all. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for questions. OK. Are there any questions? Oh, um, hello, and um, thank you for a great talk. Um, I just want to ask if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, behavioral testing, but we have a very similar structure with preconditions and actions and postconditions. How is property-based testing different? So uh, I'm not that familiar with behavioral testing, but I believe that the thing that differentiates property-based testing from other frameworks is the shrinking phase. So in case you just generate the inputs and they get bigger and bigger, sometimes it might be problematic to decipher what the actual problem was. So like, for example, with the level DB example, uh, the minimal failing test case has had 17 uh, operations, consecutive operations. And if you just use behavioral testing without uh, all the machinery for generating and shrinking later, then you would probably end up with an example that has thousands of uh, different operations. So the, the shrinking part is really the magic of property-based testing. Sounds as my question. Very well, thank you. Thank you. Right. Any more questions? Okay. So I have a simple question. So there is article testing on the toilet from Google and uh, we've advised that you shouldn't uh, do logic in your test cases. And in property testing, I have a uh, feeling that you have to implement some logic to do assertions. And how to make sure that we are not re-implementing our logic in tests? That's a great question. So uh, basically, uh, what I've shown here is how do I implement the model of key value store and I've used a plain elixir data structure for that. So what you need to do is you need to capture the behavior of your system, right? So the behavior is that you can query it and you can add stuff to it. However, the logic of actual system is not only that, right? It does sharding, it does uh, load balancing, it does many, many more things. So it's true that you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't put logic in your assertions, but you need to put a simplified model, which, which is logic, which needs to be logic of your application in the property-based test. So this is actually quite important because uh, sometimes when you, for example, start developing, you're a small startup and you just learn what you need to do and you pivot a lot, then property-based testing may not make sense, right? Because you don't know what you're doing. But after you settle on something and you see that there's this exponential uh, problem space, then you need to start thinking, okay, I, I have a very simple model, like money flows back and forth. Uh, even though the actual problem is more involved, right? You need to interface with banks, with payment providers, like that. that's the big logic, business logic. But you still need to implement the minimal logic in, in the model. So uh, I'm not familiar with that particular article, uh, but I think there are different things in here, like making a small model so that you can do the test and putting logic in the tests. I, I believe they are different things. So we have uh, like simplification of our logic just to test it. So are we sure that we are covering all test cases? Uh, cases? No, no, we're not. And as I uh, showed on my uh, on my example, if you do it naively and just test uh, the two operations that your systems uh, have, 
then you may uh, have a situation where you generate thousands of test cases and none of them touches the actual logic of retrieving stuff from the database. So you need to be careful with property-based testing and you still need to think a little bit like a unit tester, like what could go wrong so that you can encode it in the, uh, in the actual property-based test. However, in the end, the generators may surprise you very much. So in the case of generating keys and values, there, there is not too many things that can be so surprising. But with generating payment flows, uh, there's always this gotcha that someone charged back the transaction, like, I don't know, right before uh, paying next installment or did it after paying the second installment. So stuff gets more intertwined. And in these situations, property-based testing shines. Thanks. There was one more question, I think, here. Yeah. Here or here? Okay. Hi. Uh, great talk. Um, Thank you. I've used like a couple of um, property-based like frameworks. Now, what was like? Uh, I just wanted to know if you have some insights on how to choose, like, how many samples to generate. Like, you know, by default, sometimes you generate ten thousand. Samples. Sometimes you want to be more thorough and you want to generate a hundred thousand samples. But like, how do you decide those? Are just like those like ma magic numbers, or how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. So that question probably involves more statistics than uh, I'm comfortable with <laughs> dealing with. Uh, but basically, uh, during John's talk, he showed uh, the labeling mechanism where he. Uh, labeled different kinds of tests. And you can do the same thing with stateful testing. You can, for example, enforce that one of your commands runs more often than the other. And in this particular case, I showed that the, the random generated output uh, created two cases where we search uh, existing patient. And uh, it sh doesn't have to be the case, right? Sometimes we'll have much less cases. and I believe that you, at first, uh, you can just do it like eyeballing it. Okay, I see that all the tests, uh, test cases that I want to check with my property are in place. If they are with more than five, 10%, then I'm pretty sure they will be always in, in the test case. And it's good to do that because sometimes the test might be really surprising or if the actions depend on each other, and there's not one dependency like adding a patient and then retrieving existing one, but you need to, uh, for example, first pay the transaction, then charge it back, and then create a refund, and then something else, then it might be possible that this last action is so rare that you need to tweak the commands some more so that you enforce that it is tested. You showed an example of validating PESEL on the so that the the database should accept valid PESEL and reject invalid PESEL number. Uh, I wonder how would you go about testing this one? Would you gen make your generator recreate random PESELs, validate them on the test side, and check if they pass, or would you generate PESELs that are deliberately broken and see if they pass, or is there a third approach I cannot think of? Uh, I would use the second approach. So. Basically, uh, I would have a like if I'm doing a pestle generator, I would use the same function that we have for commands generation. Can I get back to it? There's this function called one off, right? And firstly, I would need to create a valid pestle generator, and that would always return valid pestle because it would pick the birth date randomly uh, or from a given range, it would pick the original number randomly and then just calculated the check digits. So it's easy to create valid PESEL generator. And then uh, apart from functions like one of, you have functions like frequency. And I can say to my generator, uh, let's generate 99% of valid PESELs using that generator. And for example, 1% of invalid PESELs using either different generator or just hard-coded wrong PESEL values. So there is a chance that someone will generate a pestle that is broken in a way you didn't think of. 
Yes, it's possible. You have to so cater for all possible I, bro brokenness of puzzle. Yeah, if I want to have, yeah, I can have another broken puzzle generator that generates a random integer and validates if it's really not a valid puzzle. If if it is uh, a valid puzzle, it rejects it and uh, checks a new one. And with puzzles, because the check number is just one digit, like only one out of ten examples would be rejected. So this way, I cover all possible broken puzzles. Uh, okay, we still have some time. Thank you. Uh, in practice, is it difficult to maintain such tests? <laughs> it is. Uh, it's difficult to write them. Maybe it's less difficult to maintain them because when you when you get the model right and uh, you have the generators, then uh, uh, it it becomes less problematic. But at first, starting writing the tests is very challenging because you encounter bugs in your system as you write the properties. For example, let's say you have this uh, name and surname in uh, from the example. If you just say that it uh, is a random string, then you can quickly get to a point where in your system uh, this new lines, those new lines are rejected, right? And now you have every time you need to think, okay, do I accept new lines in name or uh, should I change the generators? So it's a very slow process to, and it involves many decisions. But on the other hand, it also clarifies everything about your system, makes it better documented. So it, it, is, uh, it is problematic, but in the end, it should be worth it. Like It always depends on your problem. Okay, another question, if I may. Uh, uh, could you defend or uh, or uh, falsify the, the uh, sentence that picking uh, certain actions in certain order is better than just letting it uh, go random? Because this is my curiosity now. Should I just uh, define actions and let the tool uh, check any possibility? Because we are in distributed environment, right? Mm -hmm. Or should I just build the scenarios that you, that you propose? Because for me, uh, I'm curious about it. Um, again, it, it depends on what you really want to test. I think that this kind of guided execution is much better because uh, it focuses on the points that you know might go wrong and you will still get to other examples and other test executions just by accident. And if you let your system run completely randomly, like in the previous naive execution, then you, it's very hard to find actual problems with your system. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of an art where you need to, like, it's not well defined what you should do. Uh, you should uh, use your common sense and check, for example, does this uh, particular test covers the cases I would think of? If, if it doesn't, then you need to tweak it and it's usually quite easy to tweak it, uh, but still, if you just let it run randomly, there is a possibility that it will fail either very, very, very rarely or after a couple of millions of executions and no one will run their test for more than 12 hours on CI, right? I mean, you could, but that, that seems wasteful if you can uh, quite quickly get to a point where uh, the guided execution is uh, performs better. Uh, did you encounter any kind of uh, performance issues uh, when it comes to uh, resetting or rewriting the state in order to uh, to run some complicated scenario in a database uh, ten thousand times, for example? Uh, actually, no, <laughs> I didn't uh, because. Uh, so we're resetting the database from scratch every time and empty database is usually quite performant. Uh, so that's, that, that's just all. Uh, those tests, even if they insert a couple of thousands of examples and then reset, then it, it's a quite quick operation. Phoenix does similar thing with tests where like, every test is in, in a transaction that is automatically rolled back. 
I was thinking to implement something like that also for those property-based tests. Uh, I didn't get to that part yet, but we didn't have problems. OK. Uh, we have time for one more question, I think. But there are plenty of questions, so. There, there is one here. Where is? Are there some ways to make your code uh, more testable for property-based testing? Uh, are you aware of uh, some designs uh, to make it easier? Uh, yes, I think that it comes hand in hand with uh, domain-driven design because one of the principles of domain-driven design is to make your logic uh, very visible in functions. And we had a case where we had a uh, it was just a smelly code when we did some operations uh, right in the controller because uh, doing it through a web browser was the only way to do it, right? And that makes it untestable because uh, instead of just passing values, you need to pass parameters. It's harder to generate them. So if you keep your logic separate from your interfaces and you make uh, as many operations either pure functions or at least uh, very easy to call natively, for example, in IEX, then you should be fine doing property-based testing. OK. Uh, if there are no more questions, let's, let's thank the speaker once again. Yeah.